Welcome back. We are on page 34 of the 3.3 notes, and we've got an example to tackle. At the top it says compute the eigenvalues and eigenvectors for the system, and then write the general solution for the system. Now we're going to be a little cheeky about this because you'll notice it doesn't say do it by hand or do it finding the uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors by hand. So we're going to kind of be a little cheeky and say we're going to use maple. And so using maple, And at this point, you should kind of hit pause, make sure that you head on to Maple and you know how to find your eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Well, with a little bit of luck, hopefully you were able to figure out or remember the code for being able to find eigenvalues and eigenvectors. That'll be in the uh, Maple notes sheet for this section. So just a, a real kind of brief rundown. We find out that lambda one equals negative one and its associated eigenvector, which we'll call v1. That's going to be the vector negative 2, 1. And lambda 2, the second lambda is going to be negative 4. Now remember, maple sometimes gives them to us in the reverse order for absolutely no reason at all. And I've never figured out why, but that's not a mystery we're going to be able to solve right now. The associated eigenvector for that one is the really simple 1, 1. And so this one means we're going negative 2. So 2 to the left and up 1. So you can imagine we've got kind of a, um, that top one is kind of going in that direction. And then this guy is going 1, 1. So it's up 1 over 1. So it's going to be something like that. So we're going to have two straight line solutions. And we should be able to tell what those straight line solutions look like by converting these into their respective straight line solutions. So for this one, straight line solution number one is going to be great big Y of T. Remember, this is a matrix. And he's equal to E to the power negative one T times its eigenvector. And the straight line solution number two Again, it's going to be, oh, sorry, number one there. Number two, T, equals E to the negative four, T, times its eigenvector. Now, just remember, the straight line solutions are essentially their particular solutions for this system. If I were to plug in this uh, solution up here for Y, in the differential equation, take its derivative on the left-hand side, and then multiply it by that coefficient matrix on the right-hand side, I'd find out that they are 100%, both sides are equal. Now that's telling us that these two particular solutions we can put together with a coefficient um, in front of each one of them and come up with a general solution. So that means part B, which is asking us to say, what's the general solution? requires us only to know my two straight line solutions and put them together in a particular way. And so for this one, I'm just going to write, and in general, this is true, your general solution is going to be equal to your a constant times your straight line solution one plus another constant times your straight line solution for number two. And that's 100% true thanks to that superposition principle that we ran into earlier in chapter three. What that means for us though in this particular case, or in, in this, not this particular case, but for this example, we can say that the general solution must look something like constant times e to the minus t times the vector negative two, one, plus another constant no reason to believe they're the same constant, times e to the negative 4t times the vector 1, 1. So in a way, it's saying that all the solutions, the general solution, remember, is all the possible solutions. The general solution represents everything, so we can say that any solution is kind of a combination of these two straight line solutions. A little bit of this one, a little bit of that one, and depending on what coefficient you throw in there for k1 and k2. So this, as we mentioned before, this is what we called the matrix or the vector solution.
and if I wanted to rewrite this in light of the um, uh, parametric form, I'd have to first decide what I want to call my two variables. You'll notice up here, nowhere does it say I'm dealing with y and v or x and y. So I'm just going to write x of t and y of t are my two variables. And this as a pair are going to be my two parametric equations. And so the top equation is going to be negative 2 times k1 times e to the minus t and then 1 times k2, so plus k2e to the minus 4t. And on the bottom, we have 1 times k1, so this is just going to be k1e to the minus t, plus k2 times 1, so just k2 times e to the minus 4t. Now, I want you to notice something really, really important here. This was what we would call the scalar or parametric, right? So this is the parametric or scalar form. But notice, unlike the last example where it was we knew there was a relationship between the two variables, in this case, we have no idea. There's no reason to believe up here that this is representing a harmonic oscillator or it's modeling some particular real life cir circumstance where we know the relationship between the two um, dependent variables. We don't know that. So if I take my x of t equation and I take its derivative, I certainly don't get the y of t equation, right? There's no direct relationship like that between these two because we didn't start off with that assumption like we did in the previous example. So down on the bottom of this page, you'll notice that we have them uh, have written down like this. And uh, actually, you know what? I just realized these are backwards. <laughs> so this is K2 and that's K1. So associated with our notes up above. So we have this lovely little matrix form of the equation and that in this case, if you were to look at the x of t or the y of t, or you look at the uh, matrix form, but you let the time kind of roll ahead to zero, or to zero, to infinity, as t approaches infinity, this exponential term becomes just essentially zero, and so does this one. So what we have in both cases with the x and the y is that both x and y are headed towards zero as t approaches infinity, right? So that means that if you're on your phase plane and you're imagining your x and your y and everything is both x of t and y of t are headed towards zero, then you're pretty sure that everything is headed towards the origin, right? So we're pretty sure we're dealing with a situation that we might refer to as a sink, where all solutions are headed towards the origin. And we can tell that just by looking at the eigenvalues because the eigenvalues were both negative, right? So the straight line solutions, whatever direction they're pointing, everything is headed towards the origin along those straight line solutions. So what we're going to do now is kind of turn the page and take a look at the next part or excuse me, the, uh, the x of t and the y of t in this case. So I'm going to kind of stuff this in on top here. If we take a look at the x of t and the y of t, this is where we choose a k and k1 and k2 equal to 1. We get a graph that looks something like this. And you can tell just by looking at this situation that you have the two graphs, the x of t and the y of t, and you can tell which is which by kind of considering their initial conditions. And so in the case of the red graph right here, it looks like its initial value is about 2. Whereas opposed to the, the green one down here, it looks like its initial value when t equals 0 is negative 1. And so a little bit of sleuthing tells you that if you let t equals 0, and k1 and k2 are both 1. If you let t equal 0, those two terms just become 1, and you'd have negative 2 plus 1. So this green one right here, that must be the x of t, right? This must be the x of t curve, since we know that x of 0 would just be equal to negative 2 k1 plus k2 
which since both of those are 1, would just be equal to negative 1. And through a little process of elimination, you can figure out that this curve is probably the y of t. But we know it's y of t since, oops, sorry, not equals. <laughs> we know it's y of t since when you plug in 0 into the y of t equation, up here you get k1 times 1 plus k2 times 1. And if both of those are 1, then you know it's got to be equal to 2. So we can tell what our um, scene graph would look like on Maple. And you could, you could produce these by using the scene um, option for the DE plot in Maple. So you can produce that graph, or both of those graphs separately, to be able to kind of see what's going on. And if you create a full-on phase portrait, you'll be able to see something that looks like this, a direction field and the phase portrait, kind of the, all the different uh, particular solutions, along with my two straight line solutions. And again, looking at my straight line solutions that we started with, remember we had two straight line solutions, one that was along the line negative two, one, so that means go left two, up one, and then another one was right one, up one. And so you can tell which is which. So this must be my Oops, I'm going to use my same color here to kind of code this. So since y1 is that guy right there, it must be this guy right here. That's my y1. Whoops, sorry, I'm writing like you can see it. So I'm still figuring out where the edge of the screen is using this thing. So that's my y1 of t, straight line solution. And this guy up here has to be my y2 of t straight line solution. And you can tell that based on the direction that they're going. The other thing that's useful to note is you can tell this must be straight line solution too based on its direction, but you can also tell because it has an eigenvalue that is much bigger than the other one. This one has an eigenvalue, if you remember, of uh, lambda 2 is equal to negative 4. And this one down here had a lambda 1 equals negative 1. And you can tell that by looking at the graph because if you're some, somewhere out here floating out in the phase plane, the direction that seems to be more dominant, the uh, straight line solution that seems to be more uh, important for your solution curve, like if you're out here, it's definitely this line right here. It's forcing the, the solution to go more in its direction than this guy is in its direction. So this one is much more dominant because it has a larger magnitude eigenvalue. So larger magnitude eigenvalue, value implies more dominant straight line solution on the phase plane. So down at the bottom, if both the eigenvalues, as they are in this case, are negative, then that means the origin, as you can see on this particular phase portrait, is a sink. All roads lead to the origin, I guess you could say. So a simpler way, maybe, of writing this out, a more, I guess, um, that's what I'm looking for. Symbolic way of writing it is the magnitude of lambda 2 is greater than the magnitude of lambda 1. So sometimes you'll see it written this way, right? The magnitude of one eigenvalue is larger than the magnitude of the other, right? And that's telling us the same thing over here. So we've seen our first kind of general case when you have two negative eigenvalues, that tells you something about the phase plane itself.